second of the two introductory lectures. This time we will take a look at what magnetic resonance is, where it's used, why it's important, and so on. A bit less quantum mechanics and a bit more economics here, but starting still with quantum mechanics. So I remind you the conclusion of the previous lecture was that in special relativity in four-dimensional space-time we have extra operations called relativistic boosts, so the squeeze of the object dimension and the stretch in its local time as you're accelerating it in some direction, and that the commutator of the two boost generators was a rotation generator, so there were extra ways of rotating things in special relativity compared to the Euclidean space. And the, the result was, the consequence of that was, a modification in the conserved quantity, where previously only the total orbital angular momentum was conserved, now it's the orbital angular momentum and something else, and that correction is called spin. And uh, in our daily life, if we are dealing with things like carbon-13, nitrogen-15, and so on, we fundamentally inherit the spin from the very basic blocks of matter, that is, the quarks, and that is the schematic of proton structure. You have two up quarks and down quark, uh, and you can see uh, the spins are partly collinear and partly antilinear, so half here, half here, and half here, pointing in the opposite direction combined to get us a half total. And the result is that proton, as an elementary particle, and also a neutron, have magnetic moments, and then when they combine into nuclei, nuclei have magnetic moments too. What is often written in textbooks is that spin had been discovered in the stirrett gerlach experiment. That is not strictly true. What they had discovered in 1922 was quantization of magnetic moment. They did not attribute it to any particular physical mechanism. They just looked at the fact that the beam of silver atoms splits into two when you turn on the magnetic field and said, oh, magnetic moment is quantized. It wasn't until Uhlenbeck and Hautsmith that the mechanism of it was actually attributed to spin. And the applications, you are chemists, you have seen it all already. We have, of course, the great big cash cow of magnetic resonance imaging. Probably all of you have had an MRI at some point in your lives where we are detecting mostly proton magnetization inside whatever object we put in there. And it's, of course, non-invasive. You can slice into a cucumber without taking that cucumber apart in any way. And there's much research going on on contrast agents that they inject into you when they do cardiovascular MRI to make uh, your blood stand out from the rest of your tissues through different nuclear relaxation rates. And there are various molecules that are involved in that. If you read the recent papers on magnetic resonance, you will see them. There is the nuclear magnetic resonance. That's the topic of this lecture course. Of course, you know these days that synthetic organic chemists do not sign off on any molecules they have made until the NMR spectrum matches. They would often watch chemical kinetics with NMR as well, because magnetic fields, by and large, do not influence the rates and yields of chemical reactions. They do not interfere with biological processes. And so this is very convenient in chemistry and biochemistry. Then there's the older brother of nuclear magnetic resonance, using the fact that electron also has magnetic moment, and a much larger one, about 660 times larger. So all sorts of free radicals have unpaired electrons in them. Those are visible in magnetic fields as well, although at very different frequencies. And finally, we have eccentric things like magnetochemistry and magnetobiology. Certain chemical reactions, they are quite rare, but they exist, do depend on the amplitude and the direction of the external magnetic field. And so these little bisticles apparently are sensing the Earth's magnetic field and are using it for navigation. When they travel great distances from Africa to here and back, uh, they do have anisotropic magnetic responses in certain chemical reactions, very likely inside their eyes. 
And so that is the totality of what spin is useful for, but our mission for this course is nuclear magnetic resonance. So starting at the beginning again, how would we put magnetic field into quantum mechanics? Of course, everything you've seen so far for the hydrogen atom, remember momentum squared divided by 2m plus the potential and so on. You had lots of interactions with Coulomb potentials there, electron nuclear interactions, interelectron repulsion, and so on. But you might not remember where, if anywhere, have you ever seen magnetic field enter Schrodinger's equation. And that's because the chemists have been sweeping it under the rug. So what happens when you add magnetic field is it turns up not as the field itself, but as something called a vector potential of the magnetic field. And of course, through Lorentz forces, remember a flying charge when it flies through the magnetic field, it gets deflected. And so we must modify the momentum operator to account for that deflection. And so what was previously just the momentum in Schrodinger's equation becomes this generalized momentum where we have momentum proper minus the charge times the vector potential to account for the additional forces that magnetic fields exert on a moving charge. And the expressions for those potentials are quite simple. If you have an external static magnetic field, you have this B cross R, uh, that is the potential of the magnetic field. Uh, its curl is the magnetic field itself. And if we have a magnetic dipole, and that would be a nucleus or an electron or any point particle endowed with a magnetic moment, uh, we have the vector potential of that magnetic moment. So all of this goes into this modified momentum. The modified momentum goes into Schrodinger's equation, and of course, all the usual things take place. Remember how we solved this? You've done this many times by now, right? Momentum squared, now generalized, divided by 2m, plus the potential, probably Coulomb interaction. So all of those scary derivatives we had in there goes into the time-independent Schrodinger's equation. The energies come out, the eigenfunctions come out, and this is how the magnetic field dependence of electronic structure theory is accounted for. And then, in order to pull out our individual parameters, like chemical shift, J-coupling, and so on, what we need to do is make use of the fact that magnetic interactions are really weak. You and I are chemical systems, and we don't remember anything being different when we were put into a three Tesla field of an MRI scanner, right? So magnetic interactions have to be quite weak. And therefore, we are justified in using Taylor series. So that's the total molecular energy. That is the molecular energy in the absence of all fields and magnetic moments. And if they're weak, we can use the Taylor expansion. So d energy by d magnetic moment, so n here runs over x, y, z, because it can have three different directions, d e by d mu times mu, d e by d b times b, you know, that's the standard first order terms in the Taylor expansion if the two parameters are very small, Maclaurin series. And then we go to second order, and that's the second derivative with respect to the field and the magnetic moment. So times the field and the magnetic moment. Second derivative with respect to two magnetic moments of two different nuclei, for example, and so on. And so you can see that in here, we have interactions of the magnetic moment itself with something inside the molecule, interaction of the molecule with the magnetic field. But very importantly, here's the interaction of the magnetic field and the nuclear magnetic moment. So this is what's responsible for the chemical shift. And then here's the interaction of a magnetic moment with another magnetic moment, and this is where the J-couplings will eventually come from. So you have all seen them empirically so far in your various practical organic chemistry courses. You have learned to interpret them, but here we will take a look at the exact origin and the properties. So that's our nuclear shielding by electronic structure, and that's the J-coupling. And there are, of course, further terms both here and here, that are not interesting to us. They pertain, for example, to electron spin resonance, to spintronics, and other things. We are chiefly interested in magnetic resonance, in chemical shift, and in the J-coupling.
And then finally, what chemists do, quantum chemists, is they calculate these derivatives um, using what's called Hellman-Feynman theorem. That's a horrible expression. I will neither derive nor examine it. Let's just say that straightforward expressions, reminiscent of perturbation theory, if you remember those expansions, exist for all such derivatives. And this is how all response properties are calculated in electronic structure theory. If you're looking for polarizabilities, refractive indices, van der Waals interactions, here chemical shieldings and J-couplings, zero field splitting, solvent effects, any small perturbations in quantum theory in general, as applied to molecular quantum mechanics, will be calculated exactly like this. We expand the energy in some small quantities we are interested in, and we use these expressions to calculate the corresponding expansion coefficients. Okay, but enough of the complexity. Let's go into the practicalities of it. Magnetic properties of nuclei. As I told you in the previous lecture, so nuclear spin is the total angular momentum of the quantum mechanical ground state of the nucleus. It appears to be equipped with a magnetic moment. And because we are chemists, we are not smashing particles into one another, we are not diving into a black hole at the edge of the universe somewhere, we are really quite, you know, our energies are quite mediocre, kilojoules and uh, megajoules per mole. So at the energies we chemists are realistically interested in, we do not populate nuclear excited states. And so nuclear spin for us is a fundamental constant. If we have a nucleus of spin S, it has two S plus one energy levels. Remember, for spin half, we have spin up and spin down. If we have spin one, it will be spin up, spin zero, and spin down, a projection on the Z axis. So two S plus one energy levels. The largest spin I've ever seen from uh, folks in Manchester that do spintronics and spin-based quantum devices was spin 131 halves. So, and that is a, a giant uh, wheel made of iron and chromium ions with very high spin electrons in them. And all of those electrons combine and create a giant total spin. Uh, but of course, for nuclei, it is rare to have spin greater than three. I think three is the biggest integer spin and seven halves, if memory serves, is the biggest half integer spin you can have for the nucleus. Uh, there are three types broadly of nuclei. We have those where all the nucleons are paired up like carbon-12 and oxygen-16. Uh, they are spherical in shape and they have zero spin and therefore no magnetic moment. Uh, and that's really a shame because the supernova that is responsible for the heavy element content on Earth has really done a bad job in populating Earth with heavy isotopes, right? Uh, mostly here on Earth we have carbon-12 and oxygen-16, which are useless for us. Uh, we'd rather have much more carbon-13 and oxygen-17, but hey, that's, that's life. And then we have nuclei that are really useful to us. Spin half nuclei, they are still spherical, but they do have a spin half and therefore a magnetic moment. So protons, carbon-13, nitrogen-15, increasingly in pharmacology, fluorine-19, about 20% of newly approved pharmaceuticals are fluorinated. So fluorine in the mass spectroscopy is taking off. Uh, Phosphorus-31 is very useful if you are dealing with nucleic acids because of the backbone of DNA and RNA. It has phosphate in them. And so biologists who deal with proteins are, of course, interested in these three, but biologists who deal with nucleic acids make great use of phosphorus-31. And then all of the other nuclei in the periodic table that do not belong to these two categories are unfortunately non-spherical. And a few of them, like properly so, you've seen a few pictures in the previous lecture, but they are really useful because they occur in industrial materials and catalysts. A lot of catalysts, as you chemists know, would be alumina silicates of some type. So silicon-29, aluminium-27, increasingly boron, increasingly chloride, uh, and all sorts of materials all the way to actinides and lanthanides, where, again, research 
into, for example, the classification of nuclear waste has to take advantage of those nuclei. But the trouble with not being spherical is a non-spherical distribution of charge has an electric quadruple moment. And so these nuclei begin to interact and align in external electric field gradients. And as you've just seen in the previous slide, Magnetic interactions are much weaker than electric ones. And so all of these electric couplings, they're called nuclear quadrupole interaction, seriously complicates NMR spectroscopy of these nuclei. And we will not consider these nuclei in this course. We will look at the nuclei that biologists and pharmacologists are interested in uh, here. All right, so magnetogyric ratio of the nucleus. So electrodynamics requires charged spins to have magnetic moments. Uh, magnetic moment of the nucleus is proportional to its spin, and the proportionality coefficient is called magnetogyric ratio, sometimes gyromagnetic. It's one of those pointless debates in the education literature as to what to call it. So in essence, that's the spin vector, and that's the magnetic moment vector, and they are proportional to one another. If you remember your basic magnetism, we know that magnetic moments like to align in the direction of the magnetic field, right? Like just like a compass arrow in the Earth's magnetic field. And what is important is the magnetic moment aligns itself in the direction of the magnetic field, meaning that such a configuration is an energy minimum. Right, that's the low energy situation. Therefore, we must have a minus in here. So when they align to the maximum extent, we want maximally low energy. This is a very important minus. We call it the vice chancellor's minus because Mark Smith has lost it in one of his presentations on magnetic resonance. So he's a magnetic resonance spectroscopist, of course. Uh, so you're doing the vice chancellor's subject here. So always remember that this exists because certain nuclei like nitrogen-15 occasionally have negative magnetogyric ratios because they domin they're dominated by an impaired neutron in their structure. And then electrons have opposite magnetogyric ratios from protons. And in serious modern quantum technologies that involve spin, it is very important to know that your electron precesses in the opposite direction from your proton, because otherwise your quantum device isn't going to work. So remember that there is this minus here. Uh, and well, spin is mathematically similar to angular momentum. This is what the textbooks are telling you, uh, but it is physically distinct, as we saw, because it pertains to point particles, as well as to something that has physical dimensions. Energies, unfortunately, our energies are tiny in magnetic resonance. Um, and they can be estimated, the energies and the corresponding frequencies, of course, from exactly the same expression. This is expression for the energy, but in terms of, that of the, the frequency, so Planck's constant has been divided out. Um, and you will see these magnetogyric ratios documented in units of radians per second per Tesla. This is because quantum mechanics measures all frequencies as angular frequencies. There is there's no hertz in, in, in quantum theory, there's only radian per second. Um, and so the magnetic field is measured in Tesla. And so if you multiply Tesla by radian per second per Tesla, you get radian per second. If you want it in joules, multiply it by the reduced Planck's constant. Uh, unfortunately, NMR people hate joules and we record everything in those frequencies because, well, we, everything originates in physics and physicists hate SI system of units. Uh, these are the typical frequencies that you would have in an 11.7 Tesla magnet of the kind that chemistry department has in the basement. You have seen all those notices at the back of the building saying, oh, warning by pacemakers, magnetic fields, and so on. That's our magnetic resonance center. So we are responsible for those notices. Uh, 500 megahertz, so radio frequencies for the proton transition. This is a bit problematic because this is BBC Radio 4. Uh, you have to be really careful with the electronics and shielding and the filters and the denoising and so on. Uh, 
Uh, both so as not to record BBC when you're doing carbon-13 spectroscopy and so as not to interfere with BBC uh, because, you know, we've got kilowatt-grade amplifiers in there. If we're not careful about what comes out of that thing, a lot of people will be listening to NMR spectroscopy rather than music around the campus. Uh, and nitrogen is tiny, so 50 megahertz. We've benefited a lot, of course, from recent advances in radio frequency, microwave technologies that's associated with mobile phones. Uh, energy difference, so if we multiply it by the H bar, is tiny per uh, <clears throat> particle. It's of the order of 10 to the minus 19, 10 to the minus 20s uh, joules, but per mole, which is a bit uh, easier to compare with things, uh, we are 0.2 joules per mole. Of course, completely negligible on the chemical energy scale, which is why MRI instruments do not influence um, any of your internal chemistry. There are places in the universe where magnetic fields are much bigger than this. If you get yourself in the vicinity of most neutron stars or black holes, then magnetic fields there are in the gigatesla range, at which point it is the interaction is stronger than the Coulomb interaction, at which point the entirety of chemistry changes and periodic table no longer exists. Because periodic table came about because Coulomb interaction dominated atomic physics. If some other interaction, like nuclear magnetic interactions, dominates the periodic table of electromagnetic interactions, the entire structure of the fundamentals of chemistry becomes different. So somewhere in the vicinity of a magnetar, there is no chemistry as we know it. Okay, uh, because these energy differences are tiny, of course, population differences are also tiny. If we look at the ratio of probabilities of spin down to spin up, standard Boltzmann law, uh, you can see it's nearly unity. So the difference in the populations is tiny, and therefore the sensitivity is really low. Nature has a sense of humor. Not only the sensitivity is low, we also have quite low natural abundances for a few working isotopes. Thank goodness for protons, uh, for phosphorus-31 and for fluorine-19, it's 100%. Uh, but unfortunately, for nitrogen-15, it's less than half a percent, and for carbon-13, it's about 1%. So divide the already low sensitivity by another factor of 100. Um, and so, even in these large superconducting magnets, we are at the quantum mechanical limit of circuit noise in, in most of the detectors that we now have. So, ways of improving sensitivity, of course, the obvious thing to do is to go and purchase some carbon-13 glucose or carbon-13 CO2 and grow your bacteria or grow your plant either fed by carbon-13 feedstock or living in a CO2 with carbon-13 atmosphere for it to incorporate it. And this is what is normally done when we are doing protein structure determination with NMR spectroscopy. They are on quite expensive carbon-13 glucose and N15 urea, so genetically engineered bacteria are fed isotopically enriched precursors, then they synthesize their proteins, then we kill the poor little bacteria and we take their proteins away, and this is how we study them with an MR spectroscopy. And uh, in principle, uh, synthesis can be done. Richard Whitby does it for us. Uh, isotopically enriched chemical synthesis. Very expensive indeed, particularly if you're looking at something exotic like fullerenes that are fully, or diamonds even, that are fully isotopically enriched or depleted. Uh, it is possible uh, to cryogenically cool things, in particular if we take the electrical circuits, which are responsible for detection of our NMR signal, and plonk them into liquid nitrogen or even liquid helium. The noise, the electrical noise of electrons in the conductors is also a function of temperature, and so sensitivity can be improved that way. And of course, Boltzmann law, remember, has temperature in the denominator, the lower the temperature, the greater the level of spin polarization, and so sensitivity improves. Uh, 
Um, there are, of course, economic ways of doing that. We can buy a very, very expensive magnet. Um, to put things in context, the country of Great Britain has just lobbied the parliament to approve 22 million pounds for a new 28 Tesla magnet um, in Warwick. And then the government was kind enough uh, to phone the University of Birmingham and say, well, we just found some money behind the sofa. Would you like another 28 Tesla magnet? So there will be two state-of-the-art magnets just north of here, uh, hopefully in a couple of years' time, because they're only manufactured on demand and one or two is built per year on planet Earth. So this is the level of technology that we are dealing with. Thankfully, actually, it's B3 half the sensitivity, not just B, but the cost goes exponentially. And so this is not... Um, so that is actually somewhat out of date. Um, and this illustrates uh, Kuprov's power of, uh, uh, you know, future forecasting. Uh, in 2018, uh, the plans had been uh, to have 28 Tesla magnets by 2025. We are in 2025 and the magnets are shipping. So it's not going terribly quickly. You can see the scale is linear, not logarithmic in here, but um, advances in superconductor technology slowly improve these magnetic fields and, and MR is getting better and more interesting. And then there are quantum mechanical tricks. You can align spins by various uh, techniques uh, called um, dynamic nuclear polarization. We will briefly cover this at the very, very end. Uh, there are quantum technology methods like algorithmic cooling and quantum optimal control that also improve uh, that sensitivity. But still, even in the strongest magnets that modern technology can realistically manufacture and sustain, the energy level population difference, even for the most magnetic stable nucleus there is, is tiny. And okay, then we put them in the magnet and we do the spectroscopy. And that used to be in the 60s, just like every other spectroscopy that you've ever seen. It was like optical spectroscopy, like infrared spectroscopy. You have a source of radio waves, you had your physical system, you had a detector, you're shining the radio waves at every frequency through that detector, and you're looking at which frequencies are absorbed, much like you would do with optical spectroscopy, right? with a spectrophotometer, except this is radio waves. Uh, and you've got some energy levels, you know, of all of those spins. And if the frequency of your source matches the energy gap, all the usual transitions happen. This is what um, spectro that, that spectroscopy used to look like. A lot of electron spin resonance still looks like that. But, and that was a Nobel Prize in magnetic resonance uh, in the 1980s. It is possible to do it in pulsed way, and this course will focus on these methods, when you give a really strong radio frequency pulse, uh, and the system begins ringing, not unlike, um, you know, hitting a bell, uh, and then listening to the ring back, and then all the frequencies are contained here, and it's possible to extract them using a mathematical method called Fourier transform. So when we go into the nitty-gritty in the subsequent lectures, we will uh, explore exactly why and how this works. And then, you chemists, you've seen it all many times. You know that line position, the chemical shift, provides information about the chemical environment. The more electronegative groups are in the vicinity, the more electrons they have pulled away from the nucleus, the less it is shielded, the higher the frequency. And then line splitting, as also the organic chemists have told you, uh, the J coupling depends on interatomic distances, how many bonds there are between a pair of atoms, what are the dihedral angles between the corresponding bonds, it's possible to determine them. And then line integral is proportional to concentration and therefore chemical kinetics, pharmacological kinetics increasingly um, inside living organisms uh, is studied by nuclear magnetic resonance. That's ubiquitin. Uh, that's a typical protein that goes into an NMR spectrometer these days. You can see a few hundred magnetic nuclei here. So there will be a few hundred signals in here, various ways of avoiding signal overlap. Again, in this module we will cover.
Uh, and uh, this was for mathematicians because I also teach this course in physics and mathematics departments. They're interested in quantum technology. Uh, for them, for mathematicians, the spectrum is a list of all eigenvalues of a matrix. But of course, to a physicist and a chemist, that means something else. In our case, there are differences between energy levels. Uh, and of course, there are 80 years of history uh, to all of this, and we will uh, roughly cover uh, it as the course progresses. That's an example of a two-dimensional NMR spectrum. So the spectrum you saw in the previous slide is on the diagonal of this matrix, and the peaks are sticking out of the screen. And all of these blue peaks, uh, every time there is a connection here to the blue, to the other peak, that means that they are nearby in three-dimensional space. Uh, the so-called Overhauser effect spectroscopy, which we will also look in more detail in this module. So substantially, this is an adjacency matrix between the nuclei and the volumes of these peaks. If you integrate them in two dimensions, right, you get the volume. They are functions of internuclear distance. So you can measure all internuclear distances out of this. And then, of course, in half an hour, in a powerful enough computer that would recover your complete molecular geometry, in this case of strychnine. So the information can Intent of NMR spectroscopy is quite extraordinary. These days, we run a few spectra, and in a few minutes, we determine the complete structure. And this is important in situations where these molecules do not crystallize. They may be volatile, they may be liquid, they may just have some floppy tails that are not conducive to making a crystal. And so X-ray crystallography fails. Uh, it also does fail for a few unstructured proteins. A lot of regulatory regions in proteins only become structured when they're bound to something. A lot of them are supposed to be unstructured, and so such proteins would never crystallize. And so it is not possible to study those structures in any other way except by magnetic resonance. So this kind of two-dimensional version, I will show you by about the middle of the course exactly what this is and how this works. This is super useful for any pharmaceutical chemist, because this is the first thing you would need to do after synthesizing a new molecule. How does this thing look in practice? When you go into our NMR facility in the basement, you will see something like this. This is obviously all aluminium. It cannot be iron. It cannot be anything ferromagnetic, because these giant vessels are cryogenically cooled superconducting magnets, in this case corresponding to 800 megahertz proton frequency really expensive toys. They begin at a couple of million pounds. This is what they look like. Inside, you have an outside vacuum chamber pumped out to provide heat insulation. Then the inside, uh, the first inside layer is liquid nitrogen to pre-cool the further insides to prevent heat from getting in. Then there is another vacuum chamber uh, in between that and that, and the red is liquid helium at 4 Kelvin, which is required for the magnet to become superconducting. Uh, inside that helium bath, literally immersed in it, is uh, a giant superconducting coil with the current density of a few hundred amperes per square millimeter. So the amount of energy stored inside that thing is colossal. But because the resistance is identically zero, there's actually no power supply. You energize it once and the current keeps swirling for months and months and months, because it's superconducting, there's no need to continuously inject current into it. And then in the middle of it all, there's a tiny chamber. The size of this tube, so this diameter is five millimeters. The size of this magnet, you can see, is the, about human height. So a tiny five millimeter diameter chamber with electromagnetic coils that transmit and detect um, radio frequency electromagnetic fields. And then the length of this is about two centimeters. So you got about 0 0.6 to 0.8 mils of your sample in the middle of all of this complexity. And there is also a cabinet about the size of this cabinet uh, 
stuffed with radio frequency electronics and seriously complicated computers that is responsible for driving, detecting, processing, and so on of all of this. So, and we got, uh, I think we got seven of these devices of different fields and uh, different bore sizes in the basement for different purposes. There is the service facility that uh, works with organic chemists, and there's the research facility that we do to study the fundamentals of magnetic resonance itself. And typical fields you have these days, a 14 Tesla magnet costs about half a million pounds, a 28 Tesla magnet costs about 10 million pounds uh, these days. So expensive toys. And of course, the supply of liquid helium is quite critical and that thing's in trouble these days. So logistics can be complicated here. Okay, so a bigger version of the same is called an MRI scanner, where the magnet is much bigger. And so these toys begin at 30 million pounds. The bore is much larger. There are extra coils that create carefully calibrated magnetic field gradients. You will see exactly why uh, in a couple of lectures they use it for imaging. Uh, and uh, that entire thing is, well, you know, if you roll a ferromagnetic trolley past that magnet and you're not careful, you would need to de-energize the entire magnet, unstick the trolley and then re-energize it back. So that's an example of uh, a ferromagnetic thing. And of course, uh, they would insist that you remove all piercings before you get into there, and they do mean all. Even if they're not ferromagnetic, even if they're made out of aluminium or nickel, as soon as this thing starts emitting radio frequency, radiation and gradients kick in, any conductor very rapidly heats up. Uh, and that would be a bit of a problem, as you can imagine. Uh, so that's MRI, and of course there, what we simply do is we make these frequencies spatially dependent, and so we then detect the intensity or the concentration or the relaxation rate. We will cover all of that in due course. Full body scans are rare because they're basically useless, just a pretty picture, and instrument time is really quite expensive. Normally you would want a localized scan in the specific part of the body. So that's an MRI of a tumor. You can see here uh, something's wrong with this part of the brain. Uh, that's a stroke uh, where blood has entered the brain. And of course, blood contains a lot of iron and iron ions alter the local magnetic parameters of the brain tissue. And so you can detect that. It is possible to inject a, a, a compound, a, a complex of gadolinium inside the blood itself, literally several grams of gadolinium, which radically changes the magnetic properties of blood. And so blood vessels can be tracked in three dimensions. So cardiovascular MRI is done that way. Uh, this is an ordinary MRI that simply relies on different magnetic properties of different tissues. If it's a liquid, it has a different brightness in MRI compared to solid because of different magnetic properties. We'll see what they are um, in this course. That's somebody's slip disk uh, here. And then, of course, what also happens inside the brain is A, diffusion, and B, blood flow. And diffusion can be used to track the fiber bundles through the brain. Axons are quite long in neurons. And of course, diffusion would only happen along the axon, not perpendicularly, because perpendicularly the cellular membrane gets in the way. And uh, because they're only moving in one direction, it is possible to measure that direction. So fiber tracking through the brain. And finally, as I already mentioned, blood has different magnetic properties because of iron to most other tissues. And it is possible to detect which parts of the brain have locally transiently increased blood flow. So. You put somebody into an MRI machine and tell them to think about geometry or tell them to think about moving their hands and different parts of the brain light up depending on what is activated because the blood flow increases to those parts of the brain. Uh, so this functional MRI, therefore, you take uh, Homer Simpson, 
there are different parts of the brain that are responsible for different things. You superimpose anatomy onto the MRI, and then, well, two states of hemoglobin, the oxygenated and the oxygenated, have different magnetic properties. Uh, local neuron activation then creates deoxygenated hemoglobin. Body reacts by dilating local blood vessels. Blood rushes in, magnetic properties change. This is how. So not quite reading the thoughts, but we can certainly see which parts of the brain are activated at which point, down, you know, to a couple of cubic millimeters. So the general area of activity that a patient is engaged in can, in principle, be mapped. Uh, industry is quite big. Uh, again, all of these forecasts have actually come true. So magnetic resonance industry, because every pharmaceutical company has a few instruments and certainly every university does, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, certainly for MRI, right? Again, this is in multiple uh, billions. Uh, the statistics is quite significant. There are tens of thousands of instruments at research organizations and industrial companies. The market capitalization of vendors like Brooker is in the tens of billions. There are tens of thousands of papers published on the subject. Interestingly, for MRI, the market capitalization of the manufacturers exceeds the GDP of most countries. This is because of Siemens, General Electric, and other giant multinational corporations, which are in themselves bigger than certain countries. And once again, thousands of instruments, tens of thousands of medical organizations, and tens of thousands of papers being published annually. Then, of course, the role of spin, uh, you know, chemistry and biology. Photosynthesis, for example, involves generation of spin-correlated electrons when the primary photon hits um, the photosystem one. Uh, you generate spin-correlated electrons. I've already mentioned the birds that use magnetic fields for navigation. And every technology uh, based on magnetism, data storage, and spintronics uh, certain parts of quantum technology, um, they all rely on spin. And in fact, uh, mathematically speaking, a lot of quantum mechanics in general is in some sense isomorphic to a spin system. So that is quite influential for that reason. And uh, finally, uh, the list of Nobel Prizes so far in magnetic resonance, starting from Isidore Rabi in 1944, the very pioneering work on the subject, and all the way to magnetic resonance imaging Nobel Prize uh, to Lauterbourg and Mansfield in 2003. Uh, I'm pretty sure the list is incomplete because a lot of the upcoming quantum technologies also involve spin. Uh, but this is where it started. That is the first ever detected NMR spectrum, predictably of alcohol, uh, that these chaps have recorded in 1951. And from the spectra I have shown you uh, before in this presentation, you can see the resolution and the sensitivity have moved on quite a lot. So much of modern quantum technology either involves spin or mathematical lookalikes. So it's not just magnetic resonance. We will teach you here as you walk out of this lecture theater at the end of the module, you would be able to understand most of quantum computing, for example, because the mathematics is identical. And um, that's the end of the introduction. And we are going into hardcore mass from the next lecture. Any questions?